so uh, for the teaching stuff, just want to say out loud, uh, in case my dad figures out how to watch me online, even though I've showed him a hundred times. <laughs> He's a little bit technically challenged. He's figured out email. God bless him for that. And uh, web surfing. So I'm just very grateful <clears throat> for the many good things that my father uh, did for me and the stability uh, that he gave me. And there are a few memories, so many things that I don't even know uh, what to be grateful for, honestly, uh, because of uh, his influence in my life and a stable foundation in my life that allowed me to dream and wonder without fear and never had to worry about uh, who was coming home or what I was coming home to, didn't have any of that. Always knew there was going to be bread on the table, always knew um, there were going to be loving family experiences, always knew I was going to have clothes to wear, uh, always knew that my needs were going to be met, and I'm just so grateful for that. And a couple key moments uh, from my dad's uh, parenting of me that uh, really shine. Um, one is I had, I've, I've shared this story before, but I had a Christmas story experience uh, with my dad. You know the movie, uh, Christmas Story? Um, the little kid, you know, and uh, once the BB gun so bad. And my dad did that for me. Uh, fourth grade. Uh, you know, I got all my Christmas gifts and thought it was all over. And then behind the piano, tucked away, my mom didn't know about it. It's a, I mean, it's the story, before the story came out. And my dad knew that I liked the plink tin cans in the backyard because we had a big piece of property where we had a wooded area and I could do that. And uh, so he, he got me a Daisy 880 single pump BB gun. Uh, pretty sweet, man. Uh, so I killed a lot of tin cans. Uh, with that puppy and that was just one of those thoughtful things he did and another another Christmas he gave me I had this piece of junk trombone that you know uh, the slide barely moved and my parents rented it just to see if I'd actually stick with it and I loved it and so he got me a, a almost brand new looking used trombone uh, which would have cost him a pretty penny and that was another great gift that was another Christmas and then in high school, Sharon Rogers will certainly appreciate this uh, because uh, it ended up helping her out and me out <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but um, I was trying out for my first musical in high school. And it was a part for Horace Vandergelder, who was a 65, 70-year-old-ish guy, curmudgeon. And I was 15 and had no idea how to act as a 70-year-old curmudgeon. Uh, and so uh, my dad, who had a little, you know, know, knew how to ham it up, I remember telling him I was going to try out for this show, and uh, could you, you know, just hear me do the lines and all that stuff, and he heard me do the lines and immediately knew he needed to take some time <laughs> and help me come out of my shell. And what he did for me was give me an example and the opportunity to be silly. And so my dad, who is a statesman, he's, he's a wonderful statesman and, you know, can be in front of people and be polished as ever, has an amazing command of vocabulary. He got silly with me and looked, helped me see what it would look like to be gruff and get a little bit loose in my skin. And so when it came time to do the audition, I probably already had the part in the bag because I could sing better than anybody else at that time, and, but didn't know that. So I thought, you know, i got to really do this thing. So when it came, came time to do the lines, uh, I was ready to be a 70-year-old curmudgeon because my dad, by his example and with encouragement, encouraged me to take a risk. And that helped me get into an acting um, mode uh, that uh, really served me well uh, for a long time. So anyway, Dad, thank you very much uh, for, that, for that good work. I appreciate that very much. All right. So I'm going to get to a, uh, I'm going to get to Daddy here in a moment. Uh, this picture on the front of your bulletin, um, that actually is a, a, a hand sketched work uh, by a guy from Moline, Illinois, uh, that I didn't know existed until right around the time my son was born. And this guy got uh, some notoriety because his work was featured uh, in a large Christian conference. And I just love this picture. 
uh, because it's it's obviously of an infant in a father's hands, and that's that's the picture of it is in daddy's hands. And we're going to get to a place where I want you to think about our our relationship with God, even if you don't think you have one, uh, but our relationship with God as like that. And I'm going to meander my way around there because it's really critical that we get there for all kinds of reasons, particularly related to everybody always. Uh, but first I want to tell you uh, a parable that Jesus shared. I'm going to read it. This is from the New um, Living Translation. This is a parable, um, the point of which has been solidly missed by most uh, most teachers that I've been exposed to over all my years, and I've probably missed it uh, significantly over my years as well, and only came to really see what Jesus was trying to do with this thing uh, in the last several years, uh, like maybe the last three, four years, because I never had eyes to see it, because I'm an American, and that messes with my vision as it does yours. This is called the parable of the talents. Jesus would use stories like this uh, to communicate large truths, sort of metaphorical in a way uh, where you would understand the things of God, the kingdom of God in a different way. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 25. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. I'm going to say that line again because that is an operative line you need to hear. This very rich dude is going away on a long trip. And he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. You got the scene so far? Rich dude, lots of money, uh, parses it out uh, to his servants based on their ability to manage the funds. The story continues. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. And the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I've, en I've earned two more. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, now, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, <laughs> You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. What the master's doing here is calling this guy's bluff calling his lie because it was a lie and this guy is trying to trying to weasel out of things trying to put the blame on the on the master instead of owning it for himself that he just didn't feel like doing it for whatever reason because he saw the world through his eyes not through the master's eyes so the guy's calling him on it if you really thought i was that harsh make a safe investment it's not that complicated you're lying to me here and now uh, you missed the point and this guy really did miss the point. So then he ordered, ah, take the money from this guy. Uh, give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they're given, even more will be given. And they'll have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what, they, what little they have will be taken away. 
Now throw this useless servant out into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that sounds really harsh. It sounds like a horrible thing to do, but in fact, what this master's actually doing <laughs> is just having him step out into the very reality he'd been living in all along. Because that's where he'd been the whole time. Now, you and I, when we hear this story, uh, and we hear that, we hear echoing in our heads, we're, we're, we're reminiscent of these two commands that we're supposed to have, especially related to everybody always, that these two greatest commandments is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself is the second one. And when we remember that first one, as good American people, we shudder a little bit. Because we're hearing in this passage, we're seeing a picture of this master who we can't get away from that last image. We're like, oh no, what, what if I blow it? What is, what's our, my father in heaven going to do with me if I squander what's been given me? But to read the story in that way, which is a very American can-do kind of way, we can take this, we can invest it, we can be the ones to do it right. And so what we do with our American eyes is we, we turn this into a parable about performance. And we tell ourselves what we need to do in our relationship with God, obviously, is we need to perform really well for God so that God will still welcome us and love us. Because that's obviously the point of the story. But that's exactly the opposite point of the story. You know what the point of the story is? It's in the first few lines this incredibly wealthy master decides to entrust his servants with his wealth. If you and I were sitting at Jesus' feet that day, we wouldn't have heard the rest of the story because the only thing we would have been sitting with is, wait a minute, wait a minute. This master entrusted the wealth with his servants? Why didn't he just stick it in the bank where it could earn a little interest? That's the safe route. Wait a minute. What does it say about the master if he entrusted his wealth with the servants? Wait a minute. You only do that for somebody you deeply value and trust. Wait a minute. You only do that if the person you're entrusting your fortune with is somebody you trust and respect and you love. The rest of the story is details because everybody else is stuck on this idea that in this parable, God loves the servant. And the servants, in response to this overwhelming, mind-blowing, counterintuitive, countercultural love, Go and risk it all. So the one guy's like, he really loves me? He's really, he wants me to go for it and take a risk? <laughs> okay, well, let's have some fun with this. I love this guy. Let's see what we can do with this. And so he invested, and it turns out, well, the second guy, the same thing. But the last guy, the real take-home value here is the last guy missed the point of it all. That for whatever reason, he had this paradigm at work which was saying to him, it's all about performance, it's all about performance, it's all about performance. And I'm here to tell you today that if there's one thing that Jesus did not want to do, it was to set us up thinking that our relationship paradigm with God is supposed to be performance. For some of you, this is going to take the rest of your life to really believe. Because everything in the tradition that has formed us for the last centuries, really, probably only from about 400 A.D. on, so it's kind of been around a while, but from about that period forward, the primary theological message has continued to be say the right things, do the right things, and you're still in God's favor. Performance, performance, performance. But that wasn't new news to anybody in Jesus' day, and it really wasn't good news either. That was the same old news. Jesus came to blow that out of the water, to say in word and deed, you're loved by God. You're loved by God. 
lepers who say you're not loved by God, here I am, I'm touching you, I'm healing you, which everybody says is the wrong thing to do, but I'm doing it because I want you to know you're loved by God. Hey, tax collector, Matthew, I'm telling you to pack up your stuff. I want to have dinner with you today, and I want to, I want to invite you to follow me. Even though everybody hates you and they're sure that God hates you, I'm here to tell you, Levi, Matthew, Zacchaeus, another one, uh, you are loved by God just as you are. What are you going to do with that? And you know what Zacchaeus did? As soon as Zacchaeus recognized that Jesus wanted to have fellowship with him, he said to everybody who would hear it, I'm going to pay back everything. I'm going to make this thing right. I'm going to follow this guy for the rest of my life. I'll do whatever I got to do. Because he started to realize he was deeply loved by God. A woman caught in the act of adultery who all the religious people are saying, let's kill her one way or another. Let's, let's be done with her. She's just a pawn. She's worthless in God's eyes. And yet Jesus comes alongside and saves the day and makes it clear to this woman, for all these clowns doing their crazy stuff, saying this and that about you, I'm here to tell you, woman, you're not going to die today. Go and live the life you were meant to live because you're loved by God. Some of you still have these performance tapes in your head. And you're, you're walking, <laughs> it's crazy, because you're walking through uh, believing Jesus, and yet you're still kind of looking over your shoulder. Well, what if, I, what if I say it wrong? What if I believe it wrong? What if I come to the wrong conclusion? What's God going to do to me? And you need to remember this parable. You need to remember that Jesus lived by this parable. Don't you realize Jesus broke the rules all the time? Don't you realize that he broke one of the top ten commandments? How could he do that? It's because he knew he was loved by God. And he knew that the point is to live in relationship with the loving God. This is so important for you to get. This is so important for you to get. Because I want to tell you, it is, it is entirely possible for you to respect a God you are afraid of. It's it's entirely possible for you to toe the line and live a very ethical life when you're afraid of God. But the command is not to be afraid of God. The command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is very difficult to truly love somebody that you are afraid of. And I'm telling you, you're loved by God. St. Augustine was so convinced of the power of the love of God and what that implied that he said, you know, if you just meditated on that, the Christian faith comes down to this. Love God and do as you please because the one will inform everything in the other. Bob Goff has some words to say about this because he understands that people have been uh, prone to just want to get into rule following and legalism again and again and again, generation after generation. This is how our minds work. And we're used to being told what to do. We're used to being told this is what you should do. And some of you just want to know, okay, well, what am I supposed to do here? And <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll am i give you some advice on ethical thinking and how do we think theologically about things, but I'm just going to tell you the most important question is not, what should I do? The most important thing is to ask the question, who you are. So Bob Goff changes the dynamic, and he said, you know, we should stop wasting time telling people what they should do and tell people who they are. Who they are. Now, there are some people you've been wanting to tell who they are for a long time. Am I right? That's not what I mean. <laughs> I mean, as Jesus followers, we have this wonderful opportunity to look literally everyone in the eye and say to them, you are deeply and profoundly loved by God. Turn off the reverb. <laughs> you are deeply and profoundly loved by God. 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 That is the character and nature of God. You cannot undo it. You can't blow that. 
It's just there. In fact, it looks like this. Because not only does it make it a lot easier for us to love God if we really believe that we're loved by God, uh, but it starts to bleed in and helps us toward this loving your neighbor thing. So I want to remind you of the Apostle Paul, and he dealt with this same you know, performance issue stuff, a church that was divided, saying, well, my performance and my role is more important than your role, and et cetera, et cetera. And there was infighting in the church, and it was a divided thing. And so Jesus, or Paul kind of cleaned some stuff up, but then he says this. It's like Paul can't help himself. He's got to say this. And so he says in his letter to the church at Corinth, he says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps but I don't love, I'm nothing. And if I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. And then he goes in and gives us a picture of what love looks like. And this is how God loves you. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes, the ple takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We only know a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompleteness will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. But when I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, and love extravagantly. And the best of these three is love. That's how God loves you. And I have something else to say to you. That's how God loves everybody. Everybody. Even the jerks in the world. Think of in your mind right now of a jerk in the world. You're staring at one, so that's easy enough <laughs> at times. Uh, God loves that person. And you know, when we realize that God loves that person, it makes it a lot easier for us to be graceful, to tone down our attitude. I've noticed a couple things. One is related to that. And I've noticed that when I am at my most unloving, when I'm not able to love well the way that I wish I could all the time, it's because I've lost focus. I've lost touch with this grand uh, basket, this safety net of God's love. And I get into poor me attitude, I get into bad thinking, negative thinking, and I lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, no matter what is happening in my life, I'm deeply and profoundly loved. Period. So when I look at this list and think, oh boy, I haven't done that for a while and I haven't loved like that for a while, what it calls me to is an invitation to immerse myself yet again in this profound truth that we are loved by God. And I encourage you to do that. And then I encourage you to realize that uh, there are a lot of people in the world that, um, that act like they did, have not been loved for a very long time. And maybe if our eyes look at them that way, uh, it will 
It will soften our approach. It will change the way we speak into the lives of others. And that what we'll actually say is love. Bob Goff's whole thing with this book that he'll say over and over again is not that we'll become good doers, but that we will grow more and more in love. That we will become more and more love. Because love, according to the really good news of Jesus, which was the the news (laughs) that was so profound, was that God is love. Which leads to one of the craziest things that Jesus ever said. That you and I, because we've heard it before, uh, it is completely and utterly lost on us. And that is how Jesus addressed God. Remember that at the time that Jesus did his thing, um, high performance mentality. Uh, it's all about towing the line. It's all about doing everything right and believing the right thing in the right way. And if you didn't, then you were, you were toast. God was not going to have you unless you did everything just perfect. And the last thing you would do was, would be to dare familiarity with God as if to suggest that you had the right as a mere peon in this world to address such a high and mighty king. And so they treated God as, well, literally, they really did treat God as way up there in the heavens somewhere. Uh, That's where God resides, on his massive throne, and there are pictures of that in the book of Isaiah. That's their reigning principle for God, is God is distant, God is majestic, and you'd better be in line. But you know what Jesus dared to call him? Abba. You know what Abba means? Not the band, that's just the initials of their names, but Abba means daddy. Not father, but daddy. There, could there be a more familiar name for God? And when Jesus used it, everybody would have taken a, a breath. Went, what, what did you say? You said daddy in reference to God? Why would Jesus say daddy for God? It's because something happened to him profound, born out of the Jewish tradition that formed him, but something more happened to him, and we don't know exactly what. But somewhere in his journey, something happened where he became absolutely overwhelmed with this idea (laughs) that God really was love and that it meant something so much so that he could dare to call this God Daddy. It's been a long time since my kids called me Daddy. It would creep me out if they called me Daddy now. Don't get any ideas, Lakin. But I, I remember, I remember Uh, I remember what it felt like to have somebody who would look at me with that kind of trust, that kind of innocence, and know that they could trust me as their daddy. That I would be there to love them, to hold them, to comfort them, to read to them, to take them somewhere, to be silly with them, all of those things. And I just think, what if we started to? And for some of you, because of horrific childhood experiences, this is a moment for you to imagine in new ways. What might it be like if you could imagine God truly as daddy? I mean, really, as the healthiest, most complete, most loving expression you can possibly imagine a daddy could be. And I'm daring you to do it. I'm challenging you to do it. This week, I'm challenging you to do it to in your prayer life to begin it by saying, Daddy. See what happens. I think it's worth the risk because I think what it just might do, it might warm up a very cold relationship you've created with God. A a, a relationship that you've kept distant for whatever reasons you may have. A relationship that needs to be warmed by the heartbeat of God that is love that you could begin to address God with that kind of familiarity so that you might be able to finally receive the love of God. I mean, really receive it. 
and that you would finally be able to look at others recognizing that their heart cry somewhere within them is to cry the same Abba, Daddy, as Jesus. That that's everybody's hope. And that because of that, you would truly be able to see that everybody always belongs. Everybody always is loved. And it is our great privilege as daddy's boys and girls to get that very good news out. So we all have a reason to have a happy Father's Day today because there's a daddy that's legit, that's good, that won't fail you, that will be there, has been there in ways you can't see or even imagine and is here now. And it's to that one that I invite you to pray with me. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy who we run to when we're terrified, Daddy who we reach out to hold the hand of uh, when we're just walking down the street, Daddy we assume will love us and be with us who will want to play. Daddy, who if I ask, will get down on hands and knees and on my level and be silly and play and goof off. Daddy, who when it's bedtime, I can bring a book to and you'll say sweet words and, this, and give me a story. Daddy, who when I'm bawling my eyes out, you embrace me. And maybe a time or two have wept yourself along with me. Daddy, when I can't see what's going on because the challenges and the obstacles in front of me are so big, I just can't see. You lift me up and put me on your shoulders. You give me a new way to see, a new vision. Daddy, who when I don't have any money, <laughs> when I don't have the resources I need, when I think I have nothing, I turn to you and find out you've got me covered. Daddy, who, when I've screwed up, you don't slam the door in my face. You don't strike me across the face. You don't yell and scream at me and belittle me. But with loving, graceful accountability, you restore me. You help me learn so that our love will continue. Daddy, there are a hundred ways that we could continue to describe who you are with us. And I don't know which one resonates most with us here to a person. But I know that our relationship and our tone and our hearts are more full when we choose to reach up our hand to grab your finger, when we choose to bury our faces in your chest when we allow you to put us to bed in safety and security and warmth, who guide us along the best paths because you can't help it. God, Daddy, be with us as we go. We ask this in Jesus' name. He gave us the model. And he gave us the idea who was the embodiment of good news and love. Amen.